If you will, go ahead and turn in your Bibles uh, to Matthew chapter 8. Uh, I told you a couple of weeks ago that I'm not going to pause uh, in our uh, series at this point for any of our special services. We've got had Mother's Day, now we've got Memorial Day. Next week we'll have Graduation Sunday, and then after that we'll have Father's Day. We're going to continue straight on through the book of uh, of Matthew, um, because uh, as you can probably tell, it's going to take us a while to get there. Uh, we're in chapter number eight, and we've had 36. This will be number 36 of the messages that we've had on there. But keep in mind, we did one message per Beatitudes. That kind of slowed us down a little bit. Last week, we saw Jesus coming down from uh, teaching his disciples, a more intimate group of people there, uh, in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. I don't. He probably didn't call it that, but. It, that's what we call it. Well, right off the bat, we saw last week he was approached by a man with leprosy uh, that sought to be healed, and we saw that Jesus uh, healed him. And I told you, don't miss what's happening there. Everything that Jesus has taught and preached to his disciples, now he's putting on display. It's one thing teaching something. It's one thing saying you believe in something. It's a whole other thing to actually put those things into action. And we see that Jesus wasted no time putting those things into action. And we see that this morning as we continue with uh, um, Matthew's account uh, of uh, these encounters that individuals had with uh, Jesus. Remember, uh, right now we're chronologically going, but remember I told you in the book of Matthew, Matthew lumps things together. Okay, And so these are not necessarily happening in the order that they happen. But if he's dealing with a particular subject, he puts all of that together, and then he goes all of here. Uh, and so I told you it's more of a, a teaching gospel. Uh, but we want to look at this morning a message that I have uh, titled, Under Authority. And we're going to pick up reading where we left off last week right here in Matthew chapter number 8. Uh, we want to look at verses 5 and 6. It says, uh, when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. Uh, and so we see this burden that is brought to Jesus. Um, and here it says uh, from the city of Capernaum, I want to take notice of that particular city for just a moment. Uh, if you'll remember, as we've been studying through the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, we find out that this is where Jesus lived, okay? So this is after he, you know, was born in uh, Bethlehem to Nazareth, now he's in Capernaum. This is what we might call or consider his home base. You'll see a lot of times as he's traveling, he comes back through Capernaum. This is his home base. Uh, it was also the home of many of his disciples, uh, it was where Peter and Andrew lived, the brothers there, it's where James lived, where John lived, and actually the author of uh, this book, Matthew, that is also where he lived. You say, why point that out? Why do we care? With all of the teaching and preaching that Jesus has done, you would think that Capernaum be like one of the most holy cities that there are, Amen. I mean, all he's there, his disciples are there, all his preaching and teaching has taken place there. And so, I mean, this has got to be one of the holiest cities ever because Jesus was there. Well, guess what? It wasn't. Uh, in fact, it was anything but. Uh, it actually would become known as the city that rejected Jesus. Uh, in John chapter 1, verse 11, it says, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Uh, and so instead of uh, embracing Jesus and, and, and learning of all of this that he was teaching, they were actually rejecting Jesus. And instead of receiving the blessing that they could have received, they actually received a curse. We'll get to this in a little bit, but Matthew chapter 11, a couple of chapters down, in verse 23, this is what, it said, what Jesus says. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades for, it, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. I don't know if you paid attention to that. That's quite the curse. That's why, quite the charge. Jesus says, if the people of Sodom, how many know Sodom? Very wicked city. God destroyed it because of its wickedness. He says, had all of this teaching, had all of these miracles, had all these things happened in Sodom, he said Sodom would have believed. 
And they'd still be here. By the way, that's the only way they'd still be here. He said they would still be here. But you, Capernaum, you've seen them, you've witnessed them, and you still don't believe them. Why do I share that? It doesn't matter whether you present the truth. What matters is will they receive the truth. We talk all the time about our country. Our country needs a revival. Amen? Amen? Amen. Does anybody know the definition of revival? Let me give you one little point. This, this is mind-blowing. Write this down. You cannot revive that which was never alive. Amen? I mean, you can't bring something. I mean, anybody seen the movies? You know, the bring the little chargers, you know? Unless it was living to begin with, you're not going to revive a rock. So listen to me, church. Everybody here that said amen, that this nation needs revival, then who we're talking to is us, the church. Because we're the only thing that was alive to begin with. We were the only thing that was alive in Christ to begin with. And so what we're saying, if we believe this, this nation needs a great revival, is we're saying the church needs to wake up. The church needs to be revived. We've got to get out there and teach them. We've got to get out there and preach the word. We've got to get out there and share the gospel. Now... They heard it straight from Jesus and didn't believe it. So let me go ahead and warn you, not everybody's going to believe you. Not everybody's going to listen to you. But it does not remove your responsibility for sharing it. Well, we see this centurion. The centurion, that is a Gentile soldier. Uh, and uh, he was an officer, if you will, in the uh, Roman army. And in case you didn't catch it by the name, they were called centurions. Century means what? Hundred, okay. Centurion would mean a hundred. So what are we talking about? He's talking about those those were that, that were under his command. So he was a, over command of a hundred men. That's what a centurion would be. Many of the Jews hated the centurions. Now, from what we can tell in reading about them, uh, most centurions were pretty nice people. But the Jews hated them because they were Roman. And the Romans were oppressing the Jews, and so anything associated with the Romans, they just didn't like. Okay? But any way that you look at it, this particular centurion looks like he was pretty well favored. Uh, in fact, turn over, if you will, to Luke chapter number 7. This is one of the stories that we see in, in other Gospels. Um, that are being retold. So what we just read about there in Matthew, let's look at what Luke says. It's the same story here. In Luke chapter 7, look down at verse 2. Now a centurion had, uh, a, a, had a servant who was sick and at the point of death who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him, earnestly saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is one who built us our synagogue. Now, did you catch that? The Jews have gone to the centur for, uh, gone to Jesus on behalf of the centurion. Okay? Not Romans. The Jewish leaders went to Jesus. And they told him, he says, man, you, you need to come and help this guy. Because he was, uh, th this centurion was highly favored. He had a servant that was very sick. He's described here as worthy of one and described as one that loved the nation. What this centurion seems to be is what was called back then a God-fearer, okay? What a God-fearer was, there was a Gentile who embraced Israel's God but did not undergo circumcision. And so he had faith in Israel's God that, that, that God could do this, and he saw the power in Jesus that it was happening, and he says, so go get him. Now, Clarification. 
How many re- paid attention to what I just read in Matthew 7? How many paid attention to what I read in Matthew? I mean, uh, Matthew 8. How many paid attention to what I read in Matthew 7? Did you catch it? Matthew 8 says, who went to Jesus? Who? The centurion. Matthew 7 said, who went to Jesus? The Jews on behalf of him. Uh Uh-oh, we have a contradiction, don't we? Boy, people will run off. I mean, they'll take off with that. The Bible is contradicting itself. No, it's not contradicting itself. Matthew says the centurion. Luke says the servants representing the uh, centurion. And this is only difficult to understand if you allow it to be difficult to understand. Think of it this way. The president of the United States, if you don't like this one, pick another one, sends two people to you Two people out of his administration to you and officially invite you to come and dine at the White House. Okay? That's the invitation. Again, if you don't want to dine with this one, pick another one. I'm going to go dine with Reagan, but he's dead anyway, but whatever. All right. Now, you're going to tell your friends about this. Okay? Now, to one friend, you go and give the details about these two individuals. They came to you, and you tell them how you responded. Now, to another individual, to another friend, you simply say, Hey, the president has asked me to come to dinner at the White House, and I said yes. Which version is true? Both. Both. Two different versions, but they both say the same thing and they are both true. What we have before us is a legal principle known as law of agency. Y'all ready for some legal counsel today? I get $100 an hour for legal counsel. The law of agency means he who acts through another is deemed by law to be himself. In other words, if I choose you to go act on my behalf and you are acting on my behalf, it's just as if I was there. Okay? That is a concept that has been around for centuries and it's been understood for centuries. So when they say that he has sent them there, they are there on behalf of who? The centurion. So it is as if the centurion is there himself. All right? Now, understand this as we've studied. Matthew, he kind of generalizes things a lot. Okay? Luke was a doctor. That means two things. Number one, you probably couldn't read his handwriting. And number two, he loved details. So when Luke tells the story, doesn't it make sense that Luke would probably put more details into the story? If, when we get to, you know, uh, we, we just not too long ago celebrated Easter, Luke's the one that talked about Jesus in the garden bleeding the great drops of blood that nobody else mentioned. Why? Because he was a physician, because of details. You will see that when you study the book of Luke. He's, he does more detailed study. Okay? So don't let that trouble you. In fact, so many people let that trouble them, and they, they're looking for this uh, contradiction. By the way, most people that are looking for contradictions in the Bible are people that don't want to live by the Bible. They figure if they can find a contradiction, then they can pick and choose what they want to live by. But if we get there we miss the obvious thing which is right in front of us and that is the compassion it was compassion that this that that caused this man to reach out to jesus to heal his servant under roman law a master had the right to kill a slave in fact it was expected of him to kill the slave when that slave could no longer work you couldn't get what you were what he's supposed to be doing, so it was legal to go ahead and kill him. But we see a centurion appealing, or you might say pleading with Jesus to come and to heal this servant. In fact, Luke says he was a highly valued servant. 
Now, if you go back and do a little Greek study on the word there, the servant that he's talking about here, uh, it actually implies a boy or a young man. And so somehow this servant had, had really won the heart of this centurion, and he wants him healed, okay? Not only does he want him healed, he believes he can be healed. Look at verse 7. Back in Matthew, by the way. He says, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. So we see the response here uh, when he asked Jesus to come. The response, Jesus says what? I'm coming. No hesitation. He says, I will come and I will heal him. He's heading to this centurion's house. Maybe this is a good time to remind you that by Jewish custom, it was illegal <laughs> or against the law, or against Jewish custom, I should say, for a Jew to go into the house of a Gentile. But Jesus says what? I'm coming. And I'm going to heal him. And the only way he's going to come and heal him is if he does what? Enters into the house. Now notice I said it's against Jewish custom. I did not say it's against God's law. The Jews added a lot of things to God's law that were not part of the law. But we see here the reluctance in verse, the first part of verse 8. Since most Jews believed that a Gentile home was not worthy for them, the centurion assumed that this great rabbi, this great teacher, Jesus, would consider his home unworthy as well. He also shows us something about the centurion. It seems that he did not want to put Jesus into an awkward situation. Because if Jesus would have entered into the home, what would everybody be saying? I can't believe this Jew went into the home of this Gentile. It would have put Jesus in a, in a very awkward situation. So it seems like the centurion is trying to avoid putting him in that situation. I'm going to tell you, I've had some in my ministry that have done that for me, and I really appreciate it because they've thought, so preacher, I, I'm not even going to ask you because if I ask you, that's going to put you in an awkward situation, and I don't want to do that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy when people do that because there are some awkward situations they can put you in that somebody's going to say something and somebody else going to say something else. But notice his request. He says, just say the word. And my servant will be healed. This shows an extreme amount of faith that this centurion has in Jesus. Now, we might would believe if somebody touched you, they could heal you. But here he is miles away and he's just saying, just, just say it. Just say it and it will be done. So, preacher, you're telling me I don't have to be touched to be healed? Nope. Guess what? You don't have to be slapped in the head. None of that, that faith healing stuff that's going out there on TV, you don't need none of that. If Jesus wants to heal you, he'll heal you. Amen? No man has the power to do that. We're going to look at that in just a minute. But we see the realization there in verse number 9. He, we see this, and, and it's a remarkable picture of the understanding of this centurion. As an officer of the Roman army, he knew all about chain of command and how orders given by one in authority were to be unquestionably obeyed. He might not have understood all of it, but we see that he saw Jesus with one that had at least that much authority. Basically, what he is saying is, just as I obey and am obeyed, Jesus, all you need to do is command it, and the disease will either come 
or it will go as you wish. In other words, he's saying, Jesus, everything is under your authority. If you say he's healed, then the disease is gone. He's a, you, can, you can send the disease, you can take the disease back. He understands that authority, that what is going on with that servant at home is under the authority of Jesus. Let me tell you something, church. Look at me. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever you're facing right now, man might not have an answer for it, but it is under the authority of God. There's nothing going on with you right now that God doesn't know all about. And if he wants to change it, all he has to do is change it. Because it's all under his authority. Well, as we finish out, we see the blessing here in, in verse number 10 uh, through 13. It says, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into utter darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion Jesus said, Go, and let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Verse 10, we see the marveling of Jesus. This man's understanding of the authority that Jesus had, it caused Jesus to marvel. He was showing this great, uh, this great faith, this great amount of faith that Jesus thought was worthy of praise. And notice Jesus says there was no greater faith than this in all the people of Israel. Here we have all of God's people, and then we have this Gentile. And Jesus said, I have seen more faith in this Gentile than I have in all of the so-called people of God. Maybe... That's why John wrote what he wrote in verse 11 of chapter 1. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. What more did Jesus have to do to be received? Remember, the book of Matthew was being written to prove to the Jews that Jesus was truly the Messiah. Basically, Matthew saying, what more did you need? We see the message there at verse 11 certainly would be radical teaching of that day. Jesus says, Many from all over will come and sit at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know if you're paying attention to what he's saying there, but what we are seeing is a picture of the Gentiles sitting down with the Jews at the Lord's table in heaven. Everybody, he's saying, from all over will come and be a part of the family of God. Church, I'm going to tell you, if that verse doesn't do something for you, your wood's wet. Because how many Jews do we have in here? I didn't think so. That means everybody sitting under this roof is what? A Gentile. And right here we see the promise from Jesus that the Gentiles are going to be able to come to the kingdom. In fact, he says the Gentiles are going to be able to come and there's going to be some Jews that are not going to come. He said they're going to be cast into a devil's hell where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You don't get to have a guaranteed home in heaven just because you want a guaranteed home in heaven. Boy, I'm going to tell you, I posted a little snippet of, of the message a couple of weeks ago that I preached and said that, that uh, you know, people talking about Jesus and I, Jesus and me, we got our own thing. And I said, you don't have your own thing? 
Because there's only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus' way to heaven. You don't get your own way. I'm going to tell you, I stirred up some trouble with that, boy. Some people got offended. They got mad about that. They got offended. They started name-calling. hurt my feelings. And one of them was a psychic. Because they said that I need to go and spend less time at the pasta bar. I mean, it was right. I probably do. It reminded me of a three-year-old. Didn't like what I had to say. He said, you're fat. Well, you're ugly. I can lose weight. I didn't say that because of our memory verse, this, this, our challenge verse, you know, that we got to be peacemakers. So I was being a peacemaker. But they didn't like that. You know why? Because people want to come their own way. They don't want to come Jesus' way. The Jews think they're going to get there just because they're God's chosen people. It doesn't. They still have to come the same way. They still have to come through Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying here. If you don't come through Jesus, you're not going to make it. And then in verse 13, we see the miracle. A simple miracle. But powerful verse. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Listen to me. He came to the right person, he came with the right faith, and he received the right answer. That's what happens when we'll come to Jesus his way. You know what? Jesus didn't even have to leave where he was. He said, go ahead and go. And just as you've wished, that servant is healed. And the Bible says he was healed at that very moment. Church, don't miss the message in this passage. There is nothing, nothing that is not under the authority of Jesus. The question we need to ask ourselves, are we under the authority of Jesus? Are we coming to him for the answers? Jesus has authority over your sin. He and he alone is the one that can forgive you for sin. That's the only way to get forgiveness for sin is to come through Jesus. He has authority. Guess what? I can forgive you for what you do to me. You can forgive me for what I do to you. But, you know, that doesn't matter. If you want your sins forgiven, the only one that can do that is Jesus. It's under his authority. He is the one that has authority over your sickness. He alone can heal. We got all these faith healers on TV. Y'all watched them? Let me ask you a question. Where were they during COVID? Why, why weren't they going to hospitals and taking people off their ventilators and letting them walk out the front door? Where were they? Oh, you know what they'll tell you? Well, they didn't have faith. Well, no, you didn't even go see them. <laughs> you didn't even try. You know why? Because you couldn't fit with so many cameras in that room where they were sick at. And it won't nobody passing around the plate getting money. That's why. Jesus and Jesus alone has the authority over sickness. We, in fact, we just did one a couple of weeks ago. We, on occasion, have somebody that, that'll come to the front of the church and they, they want to be anointed with oil. And we'll, we'll anoint them with oil. That's fine. But you know what power that oil has? It does a great job frying chicken. Great job frying chicken. 
but it won't heal nobody. It's symbolic. It's symbolic of the church coming together, praying over this individual that God will answer their prayer for healing. That's all. We don't have the authority. We just come together in agreement that we'd love to see God do this, and if God chooses to heal, He heals. He and He alone has authority over sickness. Folks, He has authority over your situation. We might not know what you're going through, and we don't have to. He does. He knows how you got there. <laughs> he knows where you are. He knows where you're headed. And he knows that what's going to happen after the situation. God already knows all of that. He has authority over that situation. Now, let, let's be honest. There's some things that we go through we don't want to go through. Amen? But God sends us through them for a reason. Sometimes it's to chastise us. Sometimes we're out of fellowship with God and God's doing what he, what he needs to do to get us back in fellowship. Sometimes God's trying to teach us faith. We're, he's putting a difficulty on us so that we might learn to trust in Him. You know, we, we've become a society that takes, in, you know, uh, that, that takes the Bible out of context. And we think that, you know, everything, if we ask it, God's going to do it. Not always. It's, got un it's under His authority. It's His will. But sometimes He also puts us through things so that somebody else might receive the benefit. We've had, in our church, people that doctors have said, you're just going to have to deal with it. Where God has said, no, you're not. Healed. We didn't smack them. We didn't pour oil on them. Sue, did we do any of that to you? you know what her doctor told her? You're a walking miracle. Why? Because the cancer she had is gone. I'm glad the doctor understood that. Now the world will try to explain it away. But God has the authority over it. Got another one over here. Lo Lois ain't supposed to be sitting with us this morning, is she? She's supposed to be laid up in a bed just, you know, wasting away. God said, nope, I'm not finished with her yet. There ain't nobody else on this earth that can handle Joe Godfrey if I take her away. <laughs> That's the God we serve. But we need to understand it's under his authority. It's not my authority. It's not your authority. It's his authority. So we need to ask ourselves this morning, have we surrendered to the authority of God? And let me tell you something else that's under his authority. We are. <laughs> When he became our Lord, we said, you are in charge. If he's in charge, he, is over, he has authority over everything that we do. And the one thing that everybody in here is supposed to do is to go and tell and spread the gospel. That word go is an action word. It's not going to happen from where you're sitting. That revival we're looking for, it's not going to start till you get off your pew and go tell somebody. You, you want to see this world change? World into darkness? There's only one way to do away with darkness. Shine the light. I've told you this plenty of times. Darkness does not exist. Darkness is just simply the absence of light. You walk in a room, you flip a switch, guess what? Darkness is gone. Why? It didn't exist. You just didn't have any light. <laughs> but we know light does exist because God said, I am light. <laughs> so if we will take the light of God and share it, which we're under the authority to do, 
what might we see God do? You know, right here this morning, there's somebody battling with some sin. Maybe somebody battling with a sickness. We're probably all battling with situations. And God has the authority over them. But you need to come and give them to him. In just a minute, I'm ask, going to ask Sam to come, and he's going to play the invitation song I've chosen this morning. is Trust and Obey. Because that's the only way. Is we put ourselves, our life, what we're going through under his authority. What might we see Jesus do? You might be the next miracle. You might know the next miracle. If you simply trust God. Do you have that much faith? Jesus said about this centurion, I, I haven't seen faith like it anywhere. Oh, that that might be said of us. God, I'm going to trust you. you. You might be here this morning, well, you know, preacher, I'm going, but it's just a small thing. He still cares. Aren't you glad he cares about the small things? We just got to trust him. So will you come, find your way at the altar, the front pew, whatever. You come. God, I'm going to trust you. And whatever it is, whether it's your sin or sickness, it's whatever, it's a particular situation, God, I'm putting it under your authority, which is where it belongs. And I'm trusting you to work it out the way only you can work it out. Will you come? Father, we love you and praise you. Thank you for the day that you've given.